Master, come in. Yes, welcome to a very special spooktacular month of horror at Have Movies Will Game. In this podcast, we pick the darkest, scariest, and creepiest movies and talk about what made them great before giving you, the listener, yes, ideas. Oh, such great ideas on how you can play them at your role-playing table. Yeah, and, and best of all, one of these movies will be voted on to determine which game goes on to star in its own full video of actual play. Now, on with the show. Throw the switch, master. Throw the switch! <laughs> <laughs> and I said, with enough force and enough will, and enough cool. cooperation, it fits anywhere. Hey, concrete's a difficult thing to work with. Yeah. Well, this oh, is actually a story about Legos. About you else. need to be paying attention. Hey, man. You know, <laughs> concrete and Legos. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Shit, we're doing this, right? Yeah, we are. Oh, by the way, I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And this week, we are doing the uh, the new release. Well, this is actually the quickest from theater to this podcast that we have ever done. Yes. Like, I, I yeah. saw this movie yesterday. And I saw it with you for the second time yesterday. I saw it Monday. He held my hand. Yes, because yeah. he was frightened. I, I, I poked a hole in the bottom of my popcorn. I thought the movie was pretty funny. I didn't really get scared, but it, it was well done. There was... Yeah. Oh, oh. by the way, the movie is It. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> the Stephen King movie. Yeah, the Stephen yeah. King movie based off his book, It. The, uh, this is the 2017, not the old uh, Tim Curry one. No. Which I, I felt was a bit of a... It was a made-for-TV movie. What do you expect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it was good. But it had Harry Anderson in it. I, but Harry it had... Anderson is one of my weird 80s actor loves. Like, Harry Anderson, Night Court. Oh, yeah. He, mm-hmm. You know, Dave's World. He was in episodes of Cheers. Yeah. yeah him and that, that. That's why I really liked the original show. And, of course, you know, Tim Curry. But I thought Harry Anderson was pretty good in that. Tim Curry was the only reason I watched it, that, that yeah, TV yeah. version as a kid. Oh, and it had John Ritter. That was the other, yeah, he played uh, Ben in yeah. it. And the, one of the girls, the little girls in the, the original, mm-hmm. I don't remember which character that she played as the girl, uh, the young version of one of the characters. She went on to be in a series of horror movies that I love called Ginger Snaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, She was the, the black-haired girl in that. Really good. Was Ginger and Ginger Snaps like a hair color thing? Ginger Snaps was about a vampire, not vampire, werewolf. Sisters, and the first one who gets infected is named Ginger, oh, and then so she not a snaps. Hair color thing. So Ginger snaps. It's a play on words. Yeah. Oh, it, it's, and she's it, it's, a, it's a pune. Yeah. And she's a redhead, a redhead named Ginger who snaps as a werewolf. They're yeah, pretty okay. good. <laughs> All they're, right. They're... And then I wonder why my shit can't get like published when there's <laughs> stuff like that out there. Have well, you seen it? It's good. It's good. I'm staring at you. You know, you're staring at your laptop screen. No, I was staring at you for a quick moment. That, so that's, yeah, that's... in Romulan, right? <laughs> no, Klingon. <laughs> so this Vulcan. is this is uh, for the movie It, which is the basic premise of the film. It was in 1988. Older brother Bill gives his little brother Georgie a sailboat made from paper and coated with wax to float through the neighborhood gutters while it rains. Georgie takes that boat onto the street and it's unable to stop and is unable to stop it from sailing down the storm drain. In that storm drain, he finds a figure dressed as a clown who introduces himself as Pennywise the Dancing Clown. Nathaniel? And I do want to cut in to add one thing that we probably should say every time. If this is your first time listening, you've probably already realized there are spoilers here. So please put us on pause. Go watch the movie through whatever methods you prefer. Come back and we'll be waiting for you. Yeah, seriously, we're not going anywhere. This you can literally hit pause and go yeah, see yeah, the movie. Yeah, we won't go anywhere. We can't. We we'll can't. Pause. We're, we're chained well, to this mean, table. Yeah, yes. it's a heavy <laughs> table. <laughs> After introductions between Georgie and Pennywise, the dancing clown, the clown severs Georgie's arm when Georgie reaches into the drain for his boat and then drags him into the sewers. Okay, first question, sir. There was like this whole alien mouth pullback thing. Mm-hmm. That was about three seconds. Mm-hmm. So you're a kid. Mm-hmm. You're reaching into someplace scary, mm-hmm. and it goes, and its mouth opens, and the secondary mouth opens, and you're still reaching in. Why horror factor, man? 
Say versus horror factor. You You're a Palladium player. You yeah. know about horror factor. Yeah, but and if is, you fail, it causes you to pause momentarily. If you are as your enemy Palladium does something. to the table, I'll be very happy. But I don't think that's what's happening. I, I you know, I kind of thought about that both times, and I remember a kid being that age. If something were to scare me, I would just would I would have pulled back and like, yeah, your reactions away. are fairly fairly quick. But I know that he had made comment. Georgie made comment twice that his brother was going to kill him if he lost the boat. And even Pennywise followed up by saying, well, you need the boat or your brother's going to kill you. So I think he was kind of playing on that fear that I need to get it no matter what. And he was paying so much attention to the boat. He might not have seen it. He might yeah. not have seen it. I'll the tell teeth. you, I, I had the same problem with this movie that I had with The Blair Witch Project. And that is, I grew up healthy and in the outdoors and in the country. Mm-hmm. If something runs at you, <laughs> you kill it. <laughs> you pick up, which they, which they eventually do. If it kills but, it, we, if, if but that, if, if if it attacks please, you, we can kill it. you don't get scared. <laughs> or even if you are scared, you pick up a stick, you pick up a stake, you pick up a rock. You fucking if if there's a witch in the woods, you burn down the woods. <laughs> if there's something in the house, you burn down the house. Yes, I, mean, I agree. When I was a kill. kid, my house growing up, we had trails behind it, yeah. and I would go run through those trails all the time. And even though. Again, I was kind of a skinny asthmatic kid. I loved running around by myself in the woods. And my first time I ever remember getting attacked by a dog. Some wild dog was running around out there. In my brain, it was the biggest dog ever. I think it was like a scrawny, starved Rottweiler, though. And it lunged at me, and I just flipped my foot out, kicked it in the head, and mm-hmm. it went, burr, 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 ran yeah, away. Yeah, something similar. And that's when I realized the truth of the words that you just said. Yeah. See, when when I was a kid, before we moved out of Oregon, we had a this. I always considered it a haunted house. It was out on Strawberry Lane in Oregon City. This big like uh, farmhouse okay. that I was a kid on, and behind in the back of it, there was probably a good four or five acres of forest area before we sold the house, and then everything got chopped into little bits. But I remember as a kid, my brother caught a squirrel and brought it and put it in front of me and said. Don't touch it. I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go get dad. And I didn't, I really didn't, wasn't scared. So I decided, you know, it's the opposite of what you guys are just talking about. I went and tried to pet it. And this little fucking rodent bit all my fingers. Yeah. <laughs> just like one by one. Well, I put my, I had my hands out oh, to gotcha. like, you know, like when you go to, I'm just cradle, picturing cradle like, like a corn. You go to like cradle like a dog's face or a yeah, baby's yeah, yeah. face, kind of like that. And it uh. just like clamped down a couple of times and then scurried <laughs> off. So I was never really scared because I wanted to pet this animal. Yeah. I was probably three years old at the time, four years well, old maybe. Squirrel, it's cute. Exactly. And then I ran up, hands all bloody, screaming, you know. Back to what you were saying about the monster mouth. Yeah. Way too early of a monster reveal for me. Agreed. No, yeah. I disagree. I think that was perfect. I When I was watching that scene, in my brain, I was really hoping that they would do it subtly. Like, because, you know, there's a woman up there, and she's looking at it, and she sees him, and she her cat distracts her or something. Mm-hmm. I was wind, thinking yeah. that they would have her walk back turn around and see the kid gone or a smear of blood well there was there, there was, was there was knew, blood in the, but in the water. everything between that point i wasn't yeah. expecting to happen that way oh, okay I, I i just want to visit it one last time and this is this is matthew's parenting tips number 64 <laughs> i i received my first machete at age eight nine <laughs> bb gun at 10 god we had such different childhoods a 22 at 12 <laughs> And just just the thought of being scared of something, it doesn't occur to me. You can be scared of a situation. Uh, you can be scared of failure. But, but the thought of being scared by a creature, natural or supernatural, mm-hmm. has absolutely never occurred to me. And if your kid has nightmares, may I recommend a machete? Just under the pillow. Yeah, while they well, actually, night. under the mattress is under probably the, mattress. the best bet for it. I mean, just th- th- there's this, th- this victimization ideal that i never quite got in in this movie because they're in a hard scrabble town this is obviously a depressed town right yeah would, would, yeah. would everyone and, and say that clearly there are, uh, there are very bullies. small oh yeah, yeah the there place. are bullies yeah. i mean I, I don't know if i would say it's a that that street with town. the rust out cars the the very old even for the 80s kind well, of well if you even but if you looked at the the, like the house next door everything was still of the late eighties, it was that uh, yeah, house but across and, and the street was it, like a burned was, out lot and like. But that was cars. that was like part of the property of the house, though. Yeah, but with the overhead shot into the town, that wasn't a big town. No, Derry was a small yeah. town. So I mean, you're you're thinking a small rural town. I just, I honestly, I kind of disappointed in the kids. I thought they'd be tougher. 
I would go depressed. I wouldn't use depressed, but I would definitely say it was a working class town on the decline. Yeah. 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 Like whatever yeah, industry, blue collar. They, whatever Completely industry blue they collar. had, had yeah. moved away. Mm -hmm. I, I could, it was, it was on the downward slope and people in places like that, relatively tough. Wasn't it mining? Was that? No, it was a steel mill. Steel mill. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, it was a steel I always mill. default to mining because that's what they usually default yeah, yeah. to in mm -hmm. horror movies. But um, yeah, it's just, it, it's all these kids, like one kid with a switchblade, dude, that kid would have been floating in the river before the movie started. Yeah. The I Broward, mean, the Broward kid. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the cop yeah. dad. Yeah. Yeah, he would have lost it a long time ago. Yeah, that that kid would have been taken even out very even being quietly. late eighties. <laughs> yeah, he would have lost it a long time ago. Why? Why would he have lost it? Because he's a threat, and he's in a primarily forested area, as you yeah. can see from the overhead, oh, which means a lot I of people. You're saying if have it had been guns. realistic, yeah, yeah, and, oh, gotcha. he would not have lasted very long. No, but someone would have it, posted if out no, at if that, nothing that, else at make out point with a high powered rifle, and kid go. <laughs> Dude, if, what kind of kid were you? <laughs> I was a country boy. Like I said, wow. we had different childhoods. <laughs> I got a Nintendo at age 10, not a if rifle. If nothing else, it his dad... Too. If nothing else, his dad would have just probably beaten the bloody pulp out of him. Oh, well, his dad shot three bullets into the ground at his feet. Like, <laughs> I thought that was just an discipline. excellent lesson. Yeah, yeah, that, that was that discipline. Was, I know, I thought look he was at, just Look at your dick. paper man now. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was good. That's solid parenting, that is. So what the, the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> There's you should love your kids and encourage them to be good people, not shoot bullets at them. I think at, at, at that particular point, that kid was beyond redemption. Because yeah. his dad shot bullets at him. You can't take something that happened in the present and blame it no, to I the kids' No, I think that was a clear representation of a relationship that had been going on like that for a long time. You're right. That was an innocent kid who yeah. was about to blow away a cat. I'm sure... Yeah, no, that, that blame, if you sit him down is, with a therapist, I he's going to be fine. I don't believe that dad was parenting right. I think that well, kid's nobody problems was in that town. were because of that dad. Well, we go into something interesting here because every parent in that town was fucked up. Yes, it's true. Yeah, mama, every parent. Mama, and kiss me, boy. That's, kiss oh, me. yeah. <laughs> that's a small theme that I want to mention here real quick because mm -hmm. we're going to get to it later. I know you will, and I definitely mm. will. It's that parents can't be relied upon. And a story like this, and especially a game based on something like this. Well, I think there was a larger subtext because this had been going on for a long time, according going to the on, town's history. Uh, since the 1700s. So conscious or not, I believe that it was a very dysfunctional town. Because whether they realized it in their forebrain or not, they were used to what they loved dying. Oh, which yeah. made which made for a general malaise. Yeah, and uh, it was sickness of, of the, the townsfolk. Every generation, yep. they knew that people were going to be gone. And it was yeah. just every other just generation. Dealt with it. But yeah. So move the fuck out of that town. Like leave forever. <laughs> like, why do people still live in Silent yeah. Hill? <laughs> why? Why yeah. do you live there? No, pack up your shit. Have and you move. seen the housing prices in Oregon? <laughs> you can make more kids. <laughs> yeah. So this entire movie, the entire movie itself is a party movie. I think we can all agree with oh, that. Oh yeah, obviously. Definitely. Wait, wait, party as in Teen party movie? No, no, as in it's a true party. It's an gotcha. adventuring party. It's like, this isn't can't hardly wait, no. my friend. <laughs> and it centers around the Losers Club, a group of freshman esque high school school high schoolers. It follows the seven children in Derry, Maine, who encounter a freakishly scary clown named Pennywise, as we said earlier. While there is much to be frightened about the film's antagonist, not a whole lot is actually revealed about the background of the character but there is just a little bit sparse here and there for the a, movie a gamer will draw all the necessary conclusions from watching yeah. it you're looking at a demon or a transdimensional being this this isn't supernatural no i mean this is this is a critter from a, a different dimension I'm yeah gonna... one thing that i do want to say real quick is that we could probably do an entire podcast just on stephen king's it if we were like a literary podcast, because that book is over a thousand pages. But what what I want to do with this podcast is not really, or this episode is not really, the book says this and the movie does, did this, and the book said this and the movie did this. I kind of want to focus on just the movie. Oh, agreed. And not, I mean, there are going to be some places where I'm like, oh, well, the book was talked about this because there was a nod to it in the movie, but I don't, I really don't want to go down the rabbit hole too much of book. Are, is that a tie-in to my premise of it being a demon, uh, a dimensional being? Ki yes, kind okay. of, kind All of, right. yes. Also, there's probably going to be a follow-up movie, which means that we might not want to spoil what could potentially happen in the follow-up movie. Yeah, I agree. If we well, delve too deep into the book and like the nature of the beast, well, well, that well, next in, movie... In, will... in, in reading a lot yeah. of the production notes, there's there's 
there's a good disconnect between the two. But I know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to make certain that this we're focusing on the movie and not too much between oh, yeah, the book totally. and the movie. Okay. So let's get into the cast. Now, uh, being that the cast is comprised mostly of children, they haven't had a lot of movies or TV shows prior. So this this is going to be this might this round might be a little faster, uh, and I'm gonna some of the a couple of these names I don't know if I'm going to be pronouncing correctly. So as always, please forgive me. We have Jaden Lieberher who plays Bill Denbro, the the brother that went looking for Georgie. We have Jackson Robert. Oh, let's actually Bill. What's his What's his class and alignment? Well, these are kids that their class would be kid. Well, yeah, I understand. But alignment, that. I would say lawful good. Uh, I would say chaotic good because that's no? that's kid and entering teenager. I, yeah. I'd say he's on the cusp of becoming. Yeah. So, how will these characters end up as people? Okay. Because remember, they're about between thirteen and fifteen years old. So I'd say that he's chivalry Joe. He's all yeah. about. Yeah. He's lawful. I think he's going to be lawful good. Of course, he didn't step back with all the, the wistful looks from his overweight friend who was madly in love with that woman. I don't think he noticed them. No, I don't think he noticed in the movie as w- either. And then we have Jackson Robert Scott, who played Georgie, one-armed Georgie. Uh, I didn't get Georgie enough of a hint. Floats. His alignment was sadly dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the kid was gone in the opening. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the rest that we saw of him was, was just him was Pennywise. Demon, so. yeah. I'm traumatized. <laughs> that's, that's him. Uh, we have then we have Jeremy Ray Taylor who plays Ben Hanscom who is also referred to as New Kid because of the new kids on the block that he listens to. Oh Jesus, He's the chubby yeah. kid, yeah, yeah, the chubby one. Um, I'd say and the really smart good. one. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Yeah, neutral, neutral good. good. Okay, yeah. yeah, I can agree with that too because he, he walked away from the party once because he was scared, not doing the right thing because he should do the right thing. Yeah, but still overall a very good character. So yeah, yeah neutral good. Sophia Lillis who played Beverly Marsh. Chaotic good. Chaotic yeah. good. Yeah. Is and she I, also I, new? Yeah. yeah. There's a couple like smaller things, but nothing. I would furthermore like to say they made her character entirely too old Look, uh, in the way she was acting. There were some very grown-up looks that she was giving. You know, her yesterday her when we talked about that, I agreed with you, but do, doing some more reading on the production notes, because of what her character was going through in the background, yeah. um, I can understand it a little bit more because of the whole... Doesn't teach abusing, coy. abusing it, being abused. And yeah, sexually but that doesn't abused. that doesn't teach coyness. Yeah. Okay, I can I can yeah. I can see that. Okay, all right. There, there was some very flirtatious looks, whereas an abused person, which sadly I do encounter every now and then, is a much more furtive, mm-hmm. more scared than okay. than that. And I just think that was while she did an excellent job of it, I think it was a wrong choice to go down for that particular piece of acting. What do you think, Nathaniel? You got to be more specific here. What did I think uh, about? When she's talking to the the stuttering boy Ben, uh, she gives some very what I would consider grown up no, flirtatious boy looks. Was Bill. Sorry, whatever. just to let you know. Uh, some very grown up flirtatious looks, which I thought were out of character for her age and her situation. I didn't notice the looks. Really? I, yeah, oh, I did okay. not notice the flirtatious looks so much as preteen remember girls mature faster than boys oh agreed but so this, that's definitely when you think of her situation well, her though. situation is that she's been made fun of and called a slut now all this whole time and now finally somebody some people are treating her with respect especially this rather cute guy who's willing to stand up for all of his friends maybe maybe just maybe she would give him those looks i, I think the it's first it's a, li- it's a honest little looks like that in her life yeah yeah but that's you're thinking of the awkward age that that shit's learned it, and she was too young to know that i think that was that could have been the first experience that could right. have been like when she learned how to do it because okay. she felt it it came from I mean, the heart i, I, I I'm know just you're being wrong weird but romantic. i respect your argument <laughs> cheers we will drink to weird romantic and there listeners you if you agree with either of us please let us know then we have Finn. Let Wolf- us know with your best sexy look. Oh no! I don't want to. I, no. I don't care what you want. It's what I want. <laughs> as long as it, as long as it's a current age sexy look, <laughs> because I'm indifferent. Those Just, are lines I don't want to cross. <laughs> bringing it back, Finn Wood, Wood Wolfhard. Excuse me, Finn Wolfhard plays Richie Tozier. God, that's a porn name. And I know. Finn Wolfhard. I know. And then uh, we did that in the last episode. Let's not go down that <laughs> rabbit hole. No, I no, think we go down that rabbit hole every that. every single movie. <laughs> what did he play again? Sorry, uh, he played Richie Tozier. Which uh, was the? He was. I believe that was the. the mouth? No, oh, the kid with glasses. No, Eddie. Eddie was the loudmouth. Okay, so, so Richie was, was the was the the Jewish kid. The, oh right, right, right. Yeah, 
Wait, uh, are you sure he was a Jewish kid, not the smothered kid? No, Tozier was the one whose mom was making who was the. Oh yeah, he had the, the cast. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the loser medicine. cast. Yeah, the, the placebos. Verify that, right? I'm yeah. going to say chaotic good again for that for him. Yeah. Well, well, he was all about order. I'd say he was lawful neutral. Wait, at the, the beginning, the, we're talking about the kid with the meds. The kid with the medicine, the one who was like afraid of everything and yeah, wanted but to he, obey the rules he, all the time. Blew it out too. I mean. Yeah, I think he started as like being very lawful and neutral, and I think he changed his alignment. Oh, I disagree because from the very beginning he was told not to do certain things, and he was doing them. Like at the beginning, but of the he movie. hated that he was doing them. No, yeah, so but he did it. <laughs> Finn was the one with the glasses that was always like, "My oh, schlong's bigger than yours." Okay, wait, wait, Tozier? Yeah, Tozier. Okay. Oh, Tozier. Yeah, chaotic neutral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he we was all a lot agree of fun. on that. Yeah, yeah. he was a I lot of fun. Completely agree. <laughs> this is the the one with the potty mouth. Yeah, the yeah. glasses that had to wait for when they cleaned <laughs> up the blood. Yeah, every yeah. All right, sorry, sorry, listeners, we got the we got the cast mixed up there. What's this? We shut up. And then we have, uh, <laughs> you know, I like this name. I like this kid's real name. What's but this a... this puts on a lot of flex. <laughs> Chestwood. <laughs> no, this puts on like a lot of pressure. <laughs> To any child, I think. Uh, his his name? first name is Chosen Jacobs. Fuck. So his first name Fuck is wrong Chosen. With his parents. Uh, the, he, the, Chosen played Mike Hanlon or Homeschool, the, the kid with the bolt gun. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The one who grew up on the farm. I, I yes. thought he was. Oh, excellent. he was great, but that name, that's a lot of pressure. I wanted to see more of him. Yeah. He didn't really do much until like halfway through the movie when he finally joined the party. See, I, I have, I've had moments like his growing up where it's like, okay, this is part of the family biz. Kill this cute little thing. And you're like, oh, um, okay. <laughs> so I instantly, from his introduction, I had a lot of empathy with him. And I'm going to go ahead and go with Chaotic Good. Chaotic Good. Yeah, I, I would agree I'll with agree. that. I yeah I I wish that that we had had more of him yeah at the beginning rounding out we have Jack Dylan Grazer who played Eddie Casbrack uh, I Eddie. think that was the kid who yeah Eddie yeah the, the Eddie one was, was the one that you were, we're in gray water come on man we're in yeah. gray oh, yeah, water yeah, yeah. he was the with the placebos that his mom was giving him the entire time uh why oh yeah the uh his alignment with him we already talked about him we didn't agree let's or that was a little confused let's he, just he say was, it again. Okay. Uh, my thought was lawful neutral. I thought he was too heavy about sticking to the rules at first. I think he breaks out of it later. Yeah, the, that, it's, it's a conversion. And yeah. that, that's his arc in this was his conversion. Mm -hmm. What do you think he ended up as? Ooh. Because he jumped down that hole. He was swinging. Uh, he got some How conviction. Did he get down I'd that go hole. for lawful good. Yeah, at that point. I, I would too. Yeah. Like he, he had his, his personal moment there yeah. and fucking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll go from lawful neutral to lawful good. I have to agree with that. And then we have Wyatt Olieff, who played Stanley Uris, the Jewish kid. The one that, the, 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 oh, yeah. that he was going, reading from the Torah, and he had his bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah coming up. He didn't strike me as incredibly brave during any of that. I didn't really get much of an opinion of him yeah. at all. Yeah, I, he was I the most kinda, underutilized one. I, 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 th I think the DM ran him just to fill out a required class for the party. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of felt, if we're going to go on that route, it was like, the person that was supposed to play him yeah. didn't show up for the yeah. game. So it was just kind of hanging out in the background. I mean, the he was the, there. The there was a the brief time. thing about, uh, you know, how are you going to learn if you can't read Yiddish? And, you know, how are you going to make the family look at the very beginning? But that was about the only personal moment we had. There that, wasn't any that real was kind conflict of bullshit. Resolution. That whole thing. Was oh, like, no, that's very it, real. It I, I know. I know that whole... is. But it's just it. just the whole movie fell out of place. That whole how's Agreed. the family how how is the family going to be viewed if the the rabbi's son doesn't understand what he's saying? That that whole little bit over the whole movie just felt out of place. It, there, there needed to be some follow up on it for it to work. And again, it might have been that, cut. All of that, all of those intro scenes with the kids mm -hmm. and their parents was just there to cement the fact that the kids can't trust the parents. And no, that's yeah, kind right. of a story yeah, true. you have to establish earlier. That why are the kids fighting the evil? Why? They're fighting it because they can't trust the adults. Now, that being said, I, had a, I, I have a real problem with that kind of story that uh, impresses that on people because it's, it's basically a, a serial commercial done with horror. My parents just don't get it. Eat sugar smacks. Like, my parents are awesome. Like, if I told my dad that a killer clown was in the forest, that forest would be bulldozed and the earth salted and that <laughs> clown nailed to whatever tree <laughs> remained. I mean... I, I don't understand this concept of not being able to trust your parents because my parents 
while they're a little dysfunctional, are awesome. I don't I've always I, had my back. I don't think it's a it's a fact of uh, not trusting parents. It's, I think it's, it's a common meme. I, I think it's it, I mean, well, it's that it's that part where that that delineation between childhood and adulthood, and the, at the adulthood part, you just don't believe that something that might like be, right. be going yeah. on. So you blind yourself to everything. I mean, you see, it's it's a trope in in movies like this one. It's a trope in in books. It's a trope in TV shows. Mom and dad don't understand. I mean, DJ oh, yeah, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh best, Prince yeah. did it. Uh, His parents just don't understand. So, but I'm just kids I'm, have to I, take I, it into their it, own it, hands. It's, it's it's hacky. Well, it's, think it's, about it. It, is, it. Yeah, it, it, I will agree with if you. If you want to tell a story about kids and mm-hmm. only kids banding together to defeat a monster in suburbia, you have to come up with a reason for the parents to not be helping them. Yeah, otherwise, that's, yeah, that's true. Otherwise, you don't have a story. But otherwise, you don't have a story. I'm yeah. just, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of that. It's, it's <laughs> so overdone. How about, hey, Dad, let's go hunting the clown together. Well, son, this is how you stalk. <laughs> and now you have a completely different story. <laughs> Sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. And then we have Nicholas Hamilton, who plays Henry Bowers. You see, Bowers. son, if, if you take out the hamstring, the clown can't run. <laughs> <laughs> Just clip that what, that femoral artery. That's, that's so all what you got to do. What you're talking about is gravity falls, <laughs> where some of the adults are actually quite useful. <laughs> Uncle Stan and Wendy's dad together could probably go kill Now, I mean, Stephen clown. King has had some personal problems, so I imagine uh, maybe some of that's his story. You know, a man who, who writes what he writes probably did not have the happiest childhood. So maybe maybe some of that is as a reflection of what the writer knows, and a writer must do that, of course. But at the same time, I mean, it is it is hackneyed. He has a book where he talks all about his childhood. It's yeah, his own I, I, book. I won't read his fucking well. Normal. I don't actually some. like <laughs> his books. I don't but either. That book, his writing book, is actually really good because I, it's the writing book called was, On Writing. Yeah, yeah. it's not yeah. fiction. Yeah, we were talking about it yesterday, yeah. actually. I, and I, I will say though, I I don't like his books. I, I respect his ethic. I mean, Coke or no Coke, that man can sit down and write. Well, I was telling Matthew about the story that, and it's online. If you want to go out to YouTube and watch it, there's an interview at some con of George R. R. Martin and Stephen King interviewing each other back and forth about oh, right. how they write and their writing styles. And it's a great interview if you really want to take the time Two to listen to it. Two basic airplane book writers, you know, these big, <laughs> thick, massive, overly worded things. Where's and- Dean Koontz? Why was he there? <laughs> And George R. R. Martin is talking about how, you know, he's supposed to be by now done with what book number eight in the Song of Ice and Fire. Don't even get me started. No, uh, no. <laughs> and he's talking about how there are days where, you know, days and weeks and months that he's just an idea is not like grabbing him and he's having to edit and go back and rewrite and kill and and change everything that he wanted. He just wasn't happy, isn't happy with it. And he asks Stephen King, he's like, do you ever have a problem with writing? And Stephen <laughs> King just kind of looks at him and goes like, fuck no. Yeah, I'm a no, writer. I just write. I just write every day. Yeah. And, and even George R. R. Martin says, you know, like in the time I've, it, I've written these eight books, you've put out like 40. And they, they're all bestsellers. <laughs> no, I mean, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't care for his style or even his chosen subject matter. But I have enormous respect for the man's dedication as a writer. As a writer, I'll follow up on that. I I'm not a big fan of Stephen King. There are a few books that I do like. I prefer his short stories. I really Definitely. do. I really do like Christine as a full book, though. Um, well, you like Cars too. You're this is true. Guy. I mean, it's it's a 58 Plymouth Fury in that car. It's a gorgeous piece of art. But be that as it as it may, he does take very he takes these the he takes ordinary people and puts them in extraordinary events. And I do like that. I mean, if you look at the mist, there was a a very it, it was a, it was a Love very gr- uh, a well rounded group of people, ordinary people being put in this extremely extraordinary set of events. Same with uh, Under the Dome, which a friend of mine told me that had, had, that she asked me like, "Do you care about spoilers?" I said, "No, I'm not going to read this book." But and it's a show, and I haven't finished it th- yet. That's it's okay. it deviates from the book apparently right. 180 degrees. But the end of the book. Well, if what's... you hit pause, Nathaniel, <laughs> uh, we'll still. Be... <laughs> but apparently, hold on, no, hit pause. <laughs> so she tell she told me my, my a friend of mine back in Phoenix. She we were talking about this and how much she liked it, and then the 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 end game of it. And I was like, I'm not going to spoil it here. People that haven't written it read it. And I was like, really? That that's it? Really? That's the big reveal? I'm like, oh yeah, it's Stephen King. Not as bad as M Night Shyamalan, but. The, the the twist is always really that's that's what it was. 
And that's one reason why I've never I really gotten... the term is anticlimactic. Yes, and that's one reason I've never really gone on to Stephen King. He might not be good at wrapping up his stories, but one thing he's really good at is dialogue. Realistic yeah. dialogue, realistic conversations between people, the way that people would talk. That's something I've always been fond of in his stuff. Also, I don't need 30 pages to describe the uh, maw dripping of goo from a dog or uh, how long a cat stayed underground. Or the preteen orgy. Well, I I don't need 30 pages. Just like George R. R. Martin, I don't need 200 pages of a fucking mead festival. (laughs) So just get to the story. (laughs) So So are you saying he's like the the 3.5 of authors? Just the 3.5? Yeah. Like, like overdone, the, there's all these descriptions, all these rules for every possible setting and conception. I'd say that's more like George Martin. George yeah. Martin doesn't know how to finish a sentence. <laughs> 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 or a paragraph, or a page, or a book, or a series. Yeah. But Stephen King, he at least finishes his books. And then we have, uh, playing Pennywise, Bill Skarsgård. I know a lot of people. I know really, his really like sexy brother. Like personally, um, like no. biblically. Oh, okay. I, well, <laughs> there's a whole <laughs> family. Norman, True Blood. There's uh, a whole family that's getting into acting, and one of them plays in Vikings. One of them played in True Blood. One of them it does other movies. I forget. You know, the, the, the older, uh, the eldest of the team. Mm-hmm. This one, uh, Bill. Uh, yeah, Bill is was born in 1990. Apparently, <gasps> Jesus, he's Christ. not that old. It's such a Sweet summer child. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, he's a really good height to play Pennywise because he's like six foot four. Yeah. The whole family's I didn't like tall. the rodent teeth of Pennywise. You know what I'm talking about? The, yeah. the real big bunny teeth up front? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I liked that. I liked I the bunny teeth. I did. That kind of added to it. You can't go it. from bunny to predator like that. It's just That's the people. point. That the, but the bunny drew yeah. it in. That was the point. The bunny creates the semblance of weakness. Eh. And timidity, or eh. suddenly yeah. a mouthful of alien teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so, with casting on this movie, the cast of the Losers Club were asked after we didn't give his appointment. Oh, it's kind of obvious. Do Neutral we really fucking evil? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, not do even we really chaotic even, evil. Do we Neutral. even really need to yeah. do that? Also, that's an NPC. I mean, that's not a player character. NPCs unless, can have alignments. Unless. We want to totally rewrite the uh, the campaign I have, which I would be happy <laughs> to write a campaign where one player goes through and hunts down a whole bunch of that stupid would be children fun. that can't pick up sticks. That would be fun. I think I know a game for that. Anyway, Dusty, I interrupted you. <laughs> it's all right. So after the movie wrapped, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm jumping ahead just a little bit. After the movie wrapped, the cast of the Losers Club were asked whom they wanted to play their adult parts. So Finn mm, Wolf... Oh, that's interesting. So it? Finn Wolfhard, who played Richie... Said Bill Hader, which is kind of interesting. Richie, 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 what's the, the loudmouth? Yeah, just give the character, not the actor. Uh, Beverly said Jessica Chastain. Who's that? I don't know her. Another actress. Okay. Yeah. What's what she been in? Do you know? Anyway, keep going. Yeah, exactly. Mike Hanlon or Homeschool. Uh, Chadwick Boseman. Don't okay. Know yeah. Yeah, I can see that, that definitely. Can see. Uh, Eddie Kasprak said Jake Gyllenhaal. Okay. Which I can see that. I can see that. Stanley Uris said Joseph Gordon Levitt. <laughs> you should always choose to. Jo- yeah, in Joseph every Gordon movie, there Levitt. should be a part for him. Even just walking in the background. Uh, ben Hanscom uh, said Chris Pratt, which apparently there is a very large following for uh, the chubby little Ben to be played by Chris Pratt right now. Yeah. Because they have similar facial features. I can totally see it. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then Bill Denbra um, said Christian Bale. So there's going to be a lot more money behind the next one? Probably because for. this. <laughs> there's also a lot of age differences between that entire cast. Yeah. That you there, just there, there yeah. is. Yeah. Because Christian Bale is a couple years older than, than I am. Uh, uh, Chris Pratt is a few years younger than I am. I mean, they can they can do it in post with CG, but. Yeah, that, that's who the cast wanted. So originally, Skarsgård was not the intended actor to play Pennywise. Did you guys know that? No. Who was? No. Oh, believe it or not, the studio approached Tim Curry to reprise his role Is initially. He okay, but I mean, he Curry's... turned it down due to health reasons. Yeah, yeah. he's he's not doing too well. well and there's a, some more. Be good back... to yourself, Tim Curry. There, I love you, man. There's some more background in the movie. This movie was in production hell for seven to nine years. 
So that was one of the reasons why they went to Tim Crew is before his health right. issues came, before his stroke. But he was he knew himself apparently in reading about this. He knew he was having bad health issues, so he had declined the role. Uh, after that, uh, it went to Ben Mendelsohn. Sorn, I don't I'm know. Not sure. Yeah. Uh, but he turned down the role because uh, he could not agree with a, with a salary from the studio. So he, Good just, he was greedy. And then like Will, April O'Neil, she wanted more money. <laughs> Will Poltier uh, was then offered the role and accepted, but scheduling conflicts forced him to drop out of production and delays pushed filming back another year. Who but, the hell are these people? I don't know these yeah, people. Yeah, these are they're yeah. just kind of people that are there. Uh, Skarsgård was then given the role. All but right. before... Skarsgård was even like officially brought on board. There was a number of other actors that were at least tapped for the role. Uh, Hugo Weaving was in okay. the running at the very at the I can tail see that. end. Uh, those were the two finalists: uh, Hugo Weaving and Bill Skarsgård. Uh, after Poltier left, Skarsgård eventually did get the role because of his ability to play a more fun and childlike Pennywise. Poltier, I know who that is. He okay. was in the Maze Runner. Yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, I'm glad he didn't do the role. Totally glad. Scar's got way better. Weaving, Hugo Weaving, yeah. reportedly fell short in playfulness and could only play the creep factor, which <laughs> I can see. They should have but gotten I, Christopher fucking Walken. <laughs> they should have gotten. I think, though, if... You want to come down here <laughs> and get your book. <laughs> we all float down here. <laughs> that, that, that wasn't my impression this time, so... <laughs> Uh, although I think if Hugo Weaving would have played the part, I think everybody would have been, you know, saying the whole "we all float down here, Mister Anderson." So you know, replaying from the Matrix, Christopher Walken, final answer. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> Al Swearingen. Ooh, good choice. Al Swearingen. Ooh, well, they, I like everything I've seen that guy yeah. in. He has such a mobile face. I know he's got I a mean, real name, but to me, he's Al he's Swearingen. Always will be Al Swearingen <laughs> in. Um, in uh, fucking Game of Thrones, that that brief cameo bit he did with the with the hound, oh, it's so good. Oh yeah, okay. It's yeah, Ian I, McShane. That's yeah, his name. Yeah, yeah. everything Ian I've seen him in, he has been. We all float down here, house. cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then the other actors that were tapped. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still seeing it. <laughs> We've given oh clown God. makeup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Goddamn creepy. Other actors who were tapped to play Pennywise at one point in time, Johnny Depp, because of Fuck course. Fuck no. Johnny Depp. No. Uh, Richard Artemidge. Uh, Tom Hiddleston. Wait, wait, wait. Richard Artemidge. That's Armitage? The, I, mean, I know Armitage, that. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the guy from, uh, from Robin, from the BBC Robin Hood. I haven't watched that he's, one. He, he's the great villain. He's the, the, the um, mm. guy of Gisborne. No, right? no. I think you're wrong because he's played in... Uh, he's in the New Castlevania on Netflix. Yeah, uh, Berlin over, Station, though. Alice Through the Looking Glass, Hannibal. He was in Hannibal, uh, and he was in the Hobbit. He was Thorn in the Hobbit: Battle of Five Armies. So he was, yeah, Thorn Oakenshield. I can't pick. He's he's a dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is him. Yeah, yeah. No, th that's the guy. Uh, he is actually a fantastic actor. All and right. He, the, the, my my experience with him was in that the BBC Robin Hood. That's kind of like oh a, okay, uh, a reboot. But he is really good. He would have done a great job. All right. Uh, then Tom Hiddleston was no idea. He played Loki. Loki. Oh God, I hated Loki. <laughs> You've just turned off. I think our entire. I don't give a shit. I listeners. know about. I know about North Norse mythology. Loki is the friend of humanity. You know, Thor it, is the prick. It's funny. I have one of my best friends, uh, Marcus. He uh, Thor refuses, is a goddamn thug. Refuses to watch the Thor movies because he knows a lot about that that mythology and yeah. that religion. He's like, I will not it's a touch fucking it. Comic, and book. I, I, I'm like, I totally respect that out of my friend. I'm like, no, I totally get it. That's totally fine. It doesn't have to follow the mythology. So also, Jackie Earl Haley okay. was tapped to play. Oh, yeah. That would have been creepy. I could totally yeah. see that. Yeah. He played in the new Freddy Krueger as Freddy Krueger. He also played uh, Rorschach. He was yeah, Rorschach. Rorschach and yeah. Watchmen. Uh, Jim Carrey was once tied to it. That could have been interesting. A younger Jim Carrey, I could see. Maybe not so much today's Jim all right, Carrey. All right. All just, right. Just, I need to say this. Okay. I don't like Jim Carrey. I don't like him as a person. But he could have yeah. done well in that role. He's an anti-vaxxer. Yeah, he's he's a piece of human trash. Yeah. But 
he he's also you know a decent actor. He he could have done okay. I'll give him that. I hope he gets hit by a bus, but he would have done well in the role. A also, bus full of vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> also, Kirk Ace Vito, Ace Vito, I, 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 as Vito. I'm not really sure. You killed me, Smalls. I know. I know. There's I know. a lot. Sand right. lot. He is. He is Rest in uh, in Arrow. He's been in uh, Twelve okay. Monkeys TV show. Next. Uh, and The Walking Dead, Person of Interest, a lot of TV. Lot Who of was he in TV. Person of Interest? Was he the main in dude? Person? No. Oh God, no. Person of Interest. He was just in one episode. Oh, he yeah. was a person. Next. Yeah, Next. he was interest. of interest. <laughs> I'm not interested. <laughs> Good going. Uh, William Defoe. Ah, oh, William Defoe. That would have been. That, that would have been, been a great. fantastic. Yeah, wise. It would have been creepy. Yeah, I, I, I can see William being also more creepy and less. Playful. Seeing as how it was mostly CG. No. 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 Oh, you're right. They're all contortionists. No, no, no. Skarsgård. Oh, oh, no, no, hang contortionist. on. Skarsgård took uh, contortion lessons so he could do a lot of those scenes. No. Yes. No. Tell him about the eyeballs, Dusty. The, I, I was going to get to that. So do you know, did you notice how yeah. his, that was really Skarsgård eyes? He can, he can flip both eyes that way. Okay, so he's a low-level mutant. Nobody cares. <laughs> that, most of that was CG. Eat thy words, my friend. <laughs> Thou hast been proven wrong. <laughs> Paul Giamatti was tapped to play Pennywise at one no, point, which no, I no. I really like Paul Giamatti. No, I love I him, really not as Pennywise. That uh-uh. would have been interesting. No, uh, Doug Jones, which um, I don't have a lot of of. No, no, no. no. Yeah, Skip on. No, yeah, exactly. If, if you got this many, if we don't know, just yeah. And I have two more. Right. Uh, Channing Tatum. No, that would have been no, interesting. No, and my personal favorite. This would have been. I would have loved to see this actor in this role. Tilda Swinton. No. Really? Not, not me. No. I think Tilda Swinton's getting overcast. She's just <gasps> putting everything. Bite your tongue. A female Pennywise? That'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah though. I I'm mean, maybe, of Tilda. May, maybe not her, but I mean, that would bring a whole new level of it. You, you, could, you could play like, instead of just, you know, the buck tooth, you could play protective clown turns monster. I mean, there's a lot of really creepy ways you could go with that. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. I love Tilda Swinton and some of the things I've seen her in. I'm tired of Tilda Swinton. Oh, my God. I'm tired of her. Could you be, ever be tired? I say Armitage would have done the best out of everyone listed. Which that, one was he? He's the guy I looked up. He's the guy okay. from Robin Hood. He's, yeah, he's Robin Hood. really I don't good. Comparison. Okay. Incidentally, so, watch that. Yeah. I know you don't like Robin Hood, Arthurian legend, all that nonsense. No, I don't mind this Robin is a Hood. This really good like show. I don't like Arthurian legend, okay. but I love Robin Hood. If, if you like I it, you even need to like see that, that show. one that you don't like. <laughs> I thought it was a fun movie. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman and Guy of Gisborne in that was Michael Wincott. Oh, no, I, I love that movie. Yeah. I love everyone, everyone else in that like movie. <laughs> everyone else in that movie. He to who me shall not be it. named. Yeah, like Guy, <laughs> Michael Wincott is Guy of Gisborne. Christian Slater's in it. Christian Slater's in it. And Alan Rickman. Brian Blessed. Oh, yes. Is he, yeah, he's in it. He's he's uh, Robin's father. Yeah, he storms out of the castle at the yeah. very beginning in the medieval Ku Klux Klan. Really? Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. That you didn't Brian know that? Blessed? Yeah. yeah. We went in a big old Brian Blessed kick. Yeah, you, you infected me. Yeah. <laughs> well, Scott posted a message basically saying, by the way, you mentioned Brian Blessed as uh, playing who would play Porthos in real life. Well, guess what? He did play mm-hmm. Porthos in the 1966 television <gasps> miniseries. And that got me in a Brian Blessed kick, and then I in there's so much guys, 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 listeners, <laughs> go to YouTube, look up Brian Blessed oh on my Peter God. O'Toole. Yes, it's fan fucking tastic. <laughs> it is the most British thing you will ever hear. His impersonation impre- of Alec Guinness. Oh yeah, is was beautiful, spot on. Yeah. I, it was like it, like I always knew chills. he was funny, but I didn't know he was that fucking funny. Yeah. All right, circling back <laughs> around for the movie. No, this more movie. Brian Blessed. No, this movie. This movie. <laughs> okay, sorry, Dustin. This movie went through production hell, as I said earlier. It went through multiple directors, multiple production companies, multiple Pennywise is. The more than multiple. How many did you just list? Uh, that was close to 30. I want to say 25 to 30 people. Probably. It was too many people. Many. Yeah. yeah it was, uh, I'm actually kind of surprised this version of this movie came out, even on the 27 years that it's you know things are supposed to happen. At least the set was cheap. The budget was actually fairly small, but yeah. we'll get to that. So back in 2009, the Duffer Brothers of Stranger Things, they actually wanted to direct the movie when it came about. They were like, "We they want to do such this movie," a good job. but they were overlooked because 
they weren't Stranger established Things enough. hadn't come out. Yeah, yeah they yeah. weren't established enough. This movie was basically Stranger Things. I know. They they went on as we just mentioned uh, to things create was Stranger way Things. Better. And Finn Wolfhard, who played Richie, also is in Stranger Things. I thought he looked familiar. Yep. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, good. Okay. And that pays homage to uh, Another Steve show King. where you can't trust the adults. Yeah, Except but the mom. They, they actually go into reasoning for this it. movie. This movie. So after the Duffer Brothers we were thrown it, aside, man, it happens. <laughs> the studio agreed uh, to go with David. And I'm going to some of these names. I just we already gonna, know you're going to yeah. do it. Just do it. Uh, Kajing Natch. K-A-J-G-A-N-I-C-H. You're killing me. K-A-J-G-A-N-I-C-H. Kajinich. Okay. Was set to adapt the novel to the screen. And please email us, halfmovieswillgame at gmail.com. Attention, Dusty. You've taken offense by that. (laughs) (laughs) Knowing that Warner Brothers had committed to adapting it to a single standalone feature film, this director began to reread the novel in an attempt to find out the structure that would accommodate such a large number of characters in two different time periods for one movie. So he needed to cut a thousand plus page book down to 120 pages for a screenplay, which was Warner Brothers' biggest stipulation if he was going to come on as director. Then in June, th- June of 2012, um, another director was brought in because that David Kajignach couldn't cut the mustard anymore. So this director, Kerry Fukunaga, that is pr- that how it's pronounced. Right. That is pronounced. I actually wrote out a phonetic thing for that. Uh, had boarded as the director and would co-write the script with Chase Palmer. The entire production studio even changed for the movie at that point. Uh, in two- 2015, it was reported the new director had dropped out. God the damn, Fukunaga, that's a nightmare. I know, had dropped out of directing this movie. And according to the rap, Fukunaga, uh, sorry, Fukunaga, Uh, had clashed with the studio and did not want to compromise his artistic vision in the wake of budget cuts by New Line, who the movie had now gone to as a new production company. Jesus Christ. Uh, They did not want to compromise on his artistic vision, uh, even though they had greenlit the film for an additional $30 million. Uh, What was the budget on this thing? $35 million. So that seems about right. Yeah. All in costumes. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. I mean, some of the some of the set pieces they found, I was I was honestly impressed by. Yeah. So Fukunaga was quoted as saying, "I was trying to make an unconventional horror film, and it didn't fit into the algorithm of what they, the audience, wanted." He had made mention the budget was fine, as well as his desire to make Pennywise more than just a clown. But he also concluded as saying, when he left, was that we invested years and so much anecdotal storytelling in it. Chase and I had both put our childhoods into that story. So basically what he did as a director was he and Chase, the co-writer, put their own experiences into this script rather than taking material from the book. That's kind of what I got from that. Uh So that he was changing the entire... The only thing that was going to be Stephen King's It was Stephen King's It and Pennywise. Eh. Which kind of made it... Would bastardize everything. Then... In July, six, uh, in July of 2015, it was announced that Andy uh, Muschietti was in, negotia- in negotiations to direct the movie, with New Line beginning a new search for a new writer to tailor the script around his vision, which was closer to the book. Uh, now, Andy Muschietti does not have a lot of Hollywood weight behind him as of yet. He has three shorts out prior to It, but It is his first major film production. So that's not bad for, for a first... For he a did first a good go. job. I was going to actually ask you guys, what did you guys think of Pennywise in the film? It just Pennywise, not, not, not with any of the kids, not the parents. What did you guys think of Pennywise? I thought he was good. I yeah. mean, I, he played a good horrific clown. I thought he was good. Okay. Um, right. I could have used more because I'm a curious sort, and I'm this way as a gamer, too. I try and get at causes and, and motivations, mm-hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why I really like Hellraiser. Hellraiser is a good series because I, like I mean, wh- whether it's it's you agree with it or not, they they go into what the monster is, mm-hmm. and I, I like that. Um, I I would have been, and I'm going into it later, but I, I would have been very interested in learning more about wherever he comes from. Uh, but I think he dropped enough hints that an informed and an inquisitive mind can guess at it. Honestly, I thought it was a good performance. Well, I, I think whoever did it, uh, Skarsgård, did a, a very good job. There's there's a lot of nods to Stephen King's macroverse in, in this whole movie. 
And the director, I, I've heard about that. Dark Tower is supposed to like tie it all together. Or something. Well, the, well, the Dark Tower movie, they they actually stayed away from tying it together. But um, yeah, there's a lot of tie-ins to Stephen King's books. They all talk about um, the that universe, that that dimension. And Pennywise apparently comes from that universe. I thought he was my favorite so far. I, I liked him better than Tim Curry. Tim I mean, Curry got to me earlier, so I mean, yeah, yeah. he made more of an impact I, on my life. I went into it expecting it to be terrible, and came it was, wasn't was terrible. Very surprised I, the the way the kids reacted, yeah. as I said, kind of threw me. But I mean, just taking it as it was, it was it was a good movie. Yeah. I thought Skarsgård was amazing with the performance yeah. when, when he first started talking. I really liked the the. the the way he used his voice, the mm-hmm. the affectations that he put in it. I liked the dialogue. I liked the the lift that he had coming out. I liked his words as he dropped down the well, his last word. Which one? Just in that flat monotone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's, then, he did a good job of scaring the shit out of my partner who was there with me. <laughs> he Skarsgård apparently took that his role so seriously that he actually made the decision to not meet any of the, the child actors because he didn't want were, to have it, empathy. <laughs> yeah, he, for what he, he was about he to didn't, do. To he him. didn't. He pretty much. Yeah, he didn't want them to meet them. He felt that it was important for the children to not get to know him as a person, but only as the scary clown, which was kind of cool. He wanted to actually inspire real fear into the child actors. That's well done. Yeah, I and, think I think that the reactions were quite fearful. I agree. Uh, he also stated that he intellectualized the character of Pennywise and he kept going back to Stephen King's novel to truly understand the psychology behind such a devious character. Skarsgård apparently only had 10 days to prepare between booking the job and starting his shooting schedule, uh, which means that he had devoured the entire novel and internalized the character in that week and a half, which is fairly impressive. Uh, he also said, yeah, actually that's a, that's a fine piece of acting for 10 goddamn days. (laughs) Seriously. Yeah. That, that's that's well, that's when you have a rate. family of actors, you I, I think you're you're always practicing. Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, taking on a role takes time. Yeah, and that's that's impressive. Uh, he did say in an interview uh, that uh, one of the scenes that he shot where he had to scare the large group of children when he had first walked onto set in full costume and makeup. Some of the kids were intrigued, some were scared, and some actually even started shaking. However, after the scene was shot, all the children were apparently crying. Good. At how scary ah, Skarsgård's performance was. <laughs> he later admitted that he felt extremely guilty about this and he apologized to each of the actors after the camera stopped rolling, ensuring to them that the whole thing was just pretend. No, no, no. See, I did this to solidify my role. I'm sorry. I scarred <laughs> all six of you for life. <laughs> scars, guard? Oh, yeah. He guards well, the scar. Uh, uh, oh, he guards them. We need a chain of some kind that we can hang around whoever makes the worst pun. You're in the running. You're, uh, <laughs> I didn't see any. I, I normally pick out at least one continuity flaw, but someone was on their game. I didn't get anything. There, there was one. Huh. There was one at the end when they're all cutting. Everybody's cutting their hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, when they get to Bev and he pulls up the glass, there is no blood on it. Uh, should we move it towards game? Do you have anything else? Um, I, I mean, have, you got tons, but I we're have a lot. But you know 15. what? Let's. I, I'm fine with cutting. I'm there's. I'm. I'll go into more theme stuff and Pennywise, and I've kind of talked about everything that I've wanted to talk about. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to go into the gaming aspect of the movie It. Hello, listeners. This is Dusty. Thank you for checking in, and I am your co-host with arguably the better voice out of the three of us. This week's episode is brought to you by Guardian Games, who we are proud to have as our sponsor. Guardian Games is Portland's largest gaming store where they have almost every game you can think of, be it role-playing, board games, card, mini, even video games. They also have a ton of gaming-related material and swag. And if you're over 21, have a drink in the back at the Critical Sip. They have a fantastic and incredibly knowledgeable staff, and they are the hub of a very diverse and friendly gaming community. Check out Guardian Games when you can. You will not be disappointed. And thanks for listening. What's recording, Precious? Yes, my precious. So we are back from the break, and we're 
sitting here around, kind of staring at each other. This is a heavy movie. I I had to it's, I had to step outside and get a yeah. breath of fresh air, and then put on. Yeah, some that re- last bit we're gonna cut, but let's just say it's a dark movie. Our conversation took a dark turn, and we're yeah. not gonna share it with you. No, and I and I had to go back and watch a few minutes of Rick and Morty. Well, sure. now we got to talk about role playing all that. So I have a suspicion it's gonna get dark again. I so have a. F- let's see if we can hold strong. And not go there. I it's, have it's, it's the innocence, I know what game you're bringing. It's the innocence of childhood juxtaposed with this horrific demon. I mean, it's it's just it's rough, man. Well, <laughs> right there is our first gaming theme: children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have any of you played children? No. Yeah. It's difficult because yeah. you have to take a step back from everything that you know as an adult and all of your reactions. I, think to I know things. exactly where you're going to go with this one, and you have to think about what it is to be a kid. You have to learn. You have to give yourself. You have to force yourself. I've already said the word step back, but you literally have to step back from your understanding of reality and put yourself in the mindset of a child and accept that a lot of times what we want to respond to external stimuli is not the way a child would. A child doesn't know the things that we know. They're not going to have the experience that we have. They're not going to have that greater understanding of the nature of themselves and the threat that they're up against. And that threat could be something like a monster. It could be the world. It could be the fact that their parents have abused them in various ways by not listening to them or worse. So playing a child is difficult because you got to role play those reactions. Yeah, I could see that. Those motivations and the fact that you're not weighed down by the burden of a nine to five job and worrying about bills in your family. It's just you trying to be cool, trying to have friends, going out maybe trying to make good grades, trying to impress your parents, or uh, but you don't really have that many worries or that care. So everything is kind of open and free, but all of that packaged up means you just have different reactions to the universe. Yeah. So role-playing a child is difficult. Mm-hmm. Dusty, you say you've done it before. Yeah. What was your experience? I actually have... I played a, a two-session game a uh, long time ago, mm-hmm. with uh, a game called Little Fears. Oh, oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine back in Phoenix, uh, the the guy that she was dating was really big into uh, this game, and he's like, "Hey, you, would you ever have you ever played a kid?" And I was like, "No. I mean, how how difficult could it be?" And it was actually pretty damn hard because you have that adult, you know, like for me at the time, adult Dusty. This was oh god, this yeah. was. 12, probably 12 years ago. So, yeah, adult Dusty, you know, and it's like, how would I handle this situation? But I had to break it down. Like, how would Dusty as a kid handle this situation? It was a little difficult, but it was it was a fun game. I liked it, and I haven't played it since. Like, I haven't seen anybody else run it. It's a great game. I'm wary of somebody who's really into it, though. Like you explained. <laughs> it's a dark game, and there are themes of the game, which... Again, I'm wary of somebody who's really into it. He he he, wa- he seemed to be really into this game, yeah. and, and I got a weird vibe off of him anyway. So <laughs> I think that's yeah, <laughs> well well done. Yeah. Another theme then is the '80s. The '80s to me is one of the perfect places in times. Well, times, and of course, small towns. So small town 1980s to me is the perfect place in time to set a horror game. You don't have cell phones. Oh, agreed. Mm-hmm. You don't have bulletin boards. You don't yeah. have, well, you might Growing have up in a small town in the 80s, I completely agree. <laughs> you get everywhere with a bicycle. Yeah. You, the 80s is just such a ripe period of time because the world is on the precipice of technological change. The information age is about to begin for the common people, but it hasn't begun for you yet. Mm-hmm. And you don't have those fallbacks. Like, you know, the GM gives you something scary that you have to immediately deal with. You can't stop and look it up. You can't call your friend to come help you. you no, you got to pedal your ass away exactly. or kill yeah. it. You can't send a text message. Yeah, that there's a leper coming at you out of this garden of this dilapidated house. You can't just get on your phone and be like, help, 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 help. No, you have to either defeat that leper or get the hell out of there. And you have to do it by yourself. I live stream it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I do like the concept of using uh, technology in horror games, mm-hmm. especially video games. Like the Fatal Frame series was very known for it was a video game series on the PlayStation where it was a survival horror, but you didn't have a weapon. Instead, you had an ancient old camera. 
called the I just finished Obscura. Outlast, which was very close to the same. All you had was a video camera. Yeah. And so it was terrifying. Yeah, with Fatal Frame, it moves slower than Outlast, and it's got those old uh, Japanese, the original Resident Evil yeah, yeah. Silent Hill mm-hmm. controls. Oh, I hate those. But you can't stab it. You have a camera, and you have to take a picture of something at the right moment to capture its spirit. Mm-hmm. So that's a well-done use of technology. But in a tabletop game, it can kind of break the tension. Yeah. Whenever you can, if you can just dial 911 on your cell phone or text your buddy to come help out, that breaks tension. Yeah. Hopefully you can scream loud enough. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> we're basically in the same age bracket. We remember the 80s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like this and the show Stranger Things are kind of like a love letter to our youth. Yeah. Yeah, it is. We remember these things. We remember bicycles. We remember the, the movies that were in the theater at the time. We remember not knowing anything about them before we went mm-hmm. to see them, except for the posters of our friend's older brother all over the wall. Because I didn't know what Aliens was until this girl that I was obsessed with, her older brother had Alien posters everywhere. <laughs> I remember that way of finding information and being excited about the smallest thing. Well, everything was secret. Everything was secret. Yeah, there, there was no grand glut of information that you could sip at or explore through. It was secret, and everyone knew a thing, which made for much more individuality it in did. people. And things like bootlegs. I miss bootlegs. Bootleg cassettes, bootleg VHS, something mm-hmm. that somebody <laughs> got from their buddy or a buddy who copied it over. you have to have a long enough wire so that five-second delay between audio and video. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's expensive, <laughs> but mm-hmm. it's a good way to make a whole bunch of... V- I mean, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. The 80s, I think, was a great time for role-playing. So we want to do something like it. We could think of the 80s and children. Scared children. Oh, sorry. And that's the third theme because this is horror month. Yeah. Horror is difficult to actually do at a table. Mm-hmm. I had a thought of a game. It's it's probably not going to be the one you go with. Um, but go ahead and finish. And when we get to the honorables, I got some. Being scared is crucial to enjoying oh, yeah. a horror game. Like Otherwise, you kind of treat it as like a dungeon crawl. Yeah. And you just a challenge to overcome. In order to truly do a horror game, you need to build up some techniques as a GM to get your players involved. Lighting. Lighting is one. Now, uh, Mm -hmm. the the game that we're going to talk about in a bit, when I first mined uh, internet forums years ago to run this game for the first time, I was really concerned about the atmosphere of play. I really wanted to make sure that the game that I ran, that people were invested in. I wanted it to be more than us just goofing around and laughing at the stupid things and you know making fun of the villain. I wanted it to be players actually afraid mm-hmm. for their characters. So it's a difficult thing to pull off, but yes, lighting is the first thing. Setting a good mood light, uh, one technique that I learned in doing this was as you're telling the story, as you're laying everything out, as the session is beginning... Throughout that first hour of play, casually walk around and just light a candle here and there. Not all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Don't make a ritual out of it. But just as you're talking and as the players are playing with each other, just come over here and and light a a candle. I have a different scenario for something I pulled off like that. What what was yours? Um, It's one candle, and you put it at the center of the table so that everyone is facing inwards towards the light, and every other light in the room goes off. That builds two things. One, it gives one point for them to focus on, and two, it casts everything around it into shadow. That's good. I like that. So that that what's happening is the people are gathering closer and closer unconsciously to the light. It builds a party, and it makes you look over your shoulder like you would not fucking believe. I do. I believe that. That's difficult in a game with character sheets, especially character sheets with lots of stuff on them. Yeah. Because then it becomes awkward. And you want to make sure that what you do does not become awkward. So one I candle... tapers work best. What? A taper. Yeah. But don't go with like a, a thick candle. Don't go with like a votive. Yeah. Yeah. Go with... Uh, a taper sheds more yeah. light, but it gives Agreed. the exact same effect. Yeah. What I did when I did uh, this game was I had... The place that I was living at had a number of mirrors set up in the living room where we played. So I had set up a candle in front of each of the mirrors which had the backwards effect of that. It yeah, created it shadows everywhere. And then, eventually, 
I went one by one and turned off all of the other lights so that the, the change wasn't immediate. It was very slow and subtle. By the end of the session, we had achieved the same huddling closer yeah. or like looking at a thing, moving your thing close mm-hmm. to a light, trying to read it and do it. It, it really worked. It, that level of lighting got people, they were no longer distracted, I guess, by all of the other things in the room it, unless they were distracted by their shadows. So like a little teddy bear sitting over there is casting this weird ass shadow mm-hmm. and that shadow flickers and somebody's like, yeah. oh, oh, okay. I had my roommate beat things. But the trick is mm-hmm. to not be obvious with the lighting. Don't just be like, all right, one candle, all lights off. That slow descent into into almost near darkness. Yeah. What was he beating? Oh, this was a metal trash can. <laughs> and I just, I asked him, hey, like every hour or two, could you go outside and just fucking hit that thing with a broomstick? No warning. Move quietly to it. But I want a loud noise and I want to make people jump. <laughs> nice. Lighting's one thing. Horror games are difficult, especially for something where you want to, where you want everyone to be on the same page and you want them all to be experiencing that same level of tension. Another one is distractions. Cell phones, gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Laptops, gone. Tablets, gone. Anything, gone. Even that one player who's always knitting, make that person put their knitting down and yeah. focus on the moment. And if they're the kind of player that has to be knitting in order to play, it's probably not going to be the best game for yeah. them. Another thing is voice pitch. Ooh, yeah. Now, how you talk, and if you take it quieter and quieter and quieter and quieter, and they're leaning forward and they're leaning forward and they're leaning forward, and then you change your pitch, mm-hmm. it, it, it adds tension to the moment badly, especially if you're already in the dark. Also, mo- mood music. M- yeah. I, I, never, I never go with that. Cause it, I make playlists. I made a specific playlist for this one. And, well, I'll get to the game in a minute, but... You mentioned mood music, so let's let's dive into that. Okay, I like taking a mix mm-hmm. of familiar music and then also interspersed between them with horrible sounds. Mm-hmm. So for I ran a game set in 1989, and they were all kids. It was a horror game, and I made a playlist that consisted of the the hit songs from 1989. I found the top 40 mm-hmm. and put them on there. Uh, I also got the hit songs from 1988 because they're still also going to be playing. Then I put in a whole bunch of there's uh, Covenant 90 uh, Covenant 93 is that it? There's a noise band. I think it's called Covenant 93. They have some really insane noisy sounds. The score and the sound effects background to the game Dead Space and Silent Hill, Mm -hmm. and I mixed them all together. It worked very well because occasionally. They would just be finished listening to Cindy Lauper, and then suddenly this weird series of guttural ambient screams would come up, but it was just subtle. Yeah. <laughs> See? Effective use. I'm just talking about it, and Matthew's already frightened. I was just scratching. So what other <laughs> horror games have you played and had experiences with that worked? The one I was using this with was uh, the White Wolf horror. Um, it was the, the War- spirit one. Wraith. Yeah, Wraith. Mm-hmm. Oh, Wraith is good. And it, honestly, I think it would work really well for something like this. Um, especially because you can play it on your feet as well. You can actually take people into the situation. So um, Wraith is, is what I've played before and what I was doing that particular scenario for. And it was a creepy night. It, it, was, it was goddamn scary and I was fucking running it. So, and I was scared. Yeah. And the people around me were scared. So you were running it and yeah. you were scared. Yeah. Why? Because I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I knew what was going to happen doesn't mean I hadn't crafted a well, a good piece of creep. Okay. Yeah, I did that. I, I had random noises and I had absolute silence in the house, which meant every little creak, every, all, all the house settling sounds, everything sounded incredible. Incredibly loud. How long ago was this? Yeah, twenty three years. Wow, damn, twenty two years somewhere around there. It was a while ago, but it was good. We we were young ourselves when I ran this one. But every but mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Good, well done, excellent. Yeah. When you were playing in this other game, Dusty, mm-hmm. did you feel fear? No, that was the one thing yeah. I didn't. I didn't feel there wasn't no. It wasn't. It wasn't really conveyed by the by the GM. It, it just. I, I. I don't think the the situation was pushed enough. I don't think that the mood was pushed enough. Because 
honestly, when the game started, we, we, we were all over for dinner. We had like this big pasta dinner and then we segued into the game and there was no mood lighting set up. There was no background music. He was just like, this is the game. We were playing little fears. You're playing a kid. Here's a pre-generated. Here's, here's your character that you get to play. This is what I want you yeah. to do. And you just have to think like a kid. What would you do as a kid? And that was, I mean, I liked the game, but there was no mood. There was no ambiance that's to it. That's disappointing. Yeah. That's, yeah sad. That, that's, that's If you're doing this, this type of thing, that it's necessary. You absolutely have to do that. I agree. Agreed. I think that there's a number of games that could pull something like this off. But first, Matthew, you had an idea for an extended story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was working on this, and I was sitting there in the theater watching this. And I noticed something. And that was... Uh, could someone give me the girl's name again? Beverly? Yeah. Beverly was caught. Like, officially caught. And she was floating, and they all float down there. But she was able to come back because her body had only been there for a while, right? Well, she was only able to come back because she had that loving kiss. That's true. Oh, yeah. But, uh, which, which points to, like, a disconnect between the time a child is taken and to the time where the child is ir redeemably gone either that or it was just fucking with the kids by leaving her there it's it's possible but i'm choosing to use that as a postulate all right um so what i'm doing is called my brother's soul and it's a complete campaign here's the intro after the events of the movie bill is troubled by dreams of his brother georgie georgie appears to him gray and ashen one-armed and pleads for his brother's help this dream continues every night until bill agrees to help him Bill will, of course, go out and gather his party, which will be the rest of the players. Uh, here's some setting and background. The children taken by it are not consumed right away. There is a sort of digestive process where Pennywise, having transported their souls into his world or his dimension, uh, torments and feasts on their fear. It's like, let's say we, we all eat hamburgers, but you can't eat a whole cow in one sitting, no matter how hard you try. And children are kind of like that. Like cows? It, it can take years for a Cattle. soul to lose its identity as it's slowly being drained and then quietly fades away into nothingness. Now, in the real world, these children are dead, dead. But their life essence, the part of them that makes them them, is not yet gone. Uh, the gateway between our world and the world of it is, of course, the well, as we saw. Um, at the bottom of the well lies the gate. Uh, that's the one Pennywise dropped into at the end of the movie. If the PCs do enter the world of it to save his brother who's calling out, uh, they will find themselves at the gates of the Dark Carnival. The PCs must search through the nightmarish carnival to find Georgie's soul. Now, there's a variety of NPCs that you'll encounter in the carnival, such as the Barker, who's the greeter at the door, horrific, and he's, you know, oh, we didn't order delivery. Come in, come in that everyone will actually be fairly welcoming to get them into the confines of the carnival because this is fresh meat on the hoof. This Just walking like right in. The second Pinocchio movie. I've never saw the second Pinocchio movie. <laughs> Wasn't I? Yeah. All right. <laughs> there will be food vendors, but they will not be selling cotton candy. There will be horrific games such as what did I write here? Shoot your pets. Whack a mom. I mean, just awful horrific things. You know? Find the gum in the intestines. Just <laughs> scary shit. Or the movie Little Monsters with Howie Mandel. Oh, Didn't I see remember that, that movie. Yeah. But there is a very rich area there where you can combine the darkness inherent in a circus. Because circuses are dark. Oh, dear They're, God, yeah. Yes. Something wicked this way comes. Yeah. It, you're, there's there's a lot of other movies where you me. can go to get yeah. uh, just all kinds of freakish characters. And you can put all of them into this circus. Now, they have no idea where... Georgie's soul is and they are going to be looking through this circus to find it and experiencing horror after horror after horror after horror now Pennywise who one could equate to the uh, to the ringleader of this circus is going to be trying to constantly separate them in rides in booths yes he clearly gains more power when they are separated, they're separated. They're, they're, their strength yeah. comes from their togetherness so the, the DM, GM, storyteller, whatever you want to call it for whatever system you're going to use, has got to keep that in mind, that you have to separate them from their source of strength. Because whatever kind of bonus they get only happens when they're together. When you're alone, you don't get to play off the other characters for protection. You are on your own, and you are a child. And everything there sees you as food. Delicious, delicious feel. Fear veal. <laughs> 
Pokey reveal. I like that. All right. So here's how it works. Uh, the PCs must search the whole of the circus, encountering all the horrors that Pennywise can throw at them. Uh, of course, Pennywise will try and split them up to break them down into a state where he can consume them as well. Georgie is being kept along with a hundred other children in various states of disillusion. And think, uh, think Dumbo's cage in the animated movie, mm-hmm. uh, the, which is basically a cage on wheels, which is mm-hmm. rolled in, in something like that. Now, they're visible as, as ghostly humans. And the people who work at uh, the circus, all these various demons and imps and dimensional beings, will occasionally stop by, freak them out, and gain power from them. You can, if you get near the area, you can hear them by their childlike screaming, crying, pleading for mercy. Um, scare them again to gain fear substance <laughs> far from them. All right. uh, the PCs will find this section eventually and attempt to free Georgie, possibly others. Now, it's important to understand that Georgie is dead. He is only a soul. When found and freed from the cage, he will flow into whatever weapon Bill is carrying because Bill is his brother. So here's hoping that Bill was smart enough, as in the end, because he's certainly learned from his mm-hmm. experiences yeah. in the movie, right? Yeah. To bring a fucking baseball bat oh, just or a hatchet gotta be yeah. a bat. or a yeah. machete or something. Something bludgeoning, something. Yeah. He, will, he will move into that as a familiar vessel that's carried by someone he loves. Um, he will be able to speak mind to mind with the car- carrier in the form of like a sentient weapon. So that'll be a lot of uh, GM note passing or just telling it in a creepy voice. Now that he's infused into the weapon, they can actually cause serious damage, but they're still vastly outnumbered. So now what they have to do is make it the decision to either just take Georgie and run, which is the real realization. Mm-hmm. That, you know, that's, that's why they came there, but there's still all these other children. So they can attempt to raid the larder, as mm-hmm. it were, and free these other children. They don't have to. They're just here for Georgie. But it would say something about them if they didn't do that. Anyway, they're, you know, waves of the monsters, uh, but they will, in fact, have a powerful weapon this time, and they can fight back. Will they power level up their weapons by adding more souls to them? Because... No, it's, it's one soul <laughs> per object. Oh. It's basically a new body. Uh-huh. Um, whatever, whatever plane this is in, whatever... Uh, realm of existence this is in it it takes as a granted that the spirit and the body must be connected it's necessary to separate the two in order to feed on the energy so what about when they bring the items back through that's the interesting well? if they succeed they emerge in the abandoned house with georgie's soul lodged in a weapon he can still talk to his carrier in the real world but he is stuck in the weapon there is no more transferring this amalgam of soul and weapon would be a powerful tool 27 years from now. It could also be really depressing for th- that kid. Stuck Nobody in gets that out bat. of this happiness, but at least he has yeah. his brother. I guess. And you have to deal with some real-world consequences of talking to your baseball bat. Brother's going to get old. That bat's going to be in the corner when his brother brings over a girl. <laughs> how do you think sentient <laughs> weapons start? And, uh, God, I saw that on the Internet. That's not how you use a baseball bat. <laughs> and but Georgie's got to come of age. Come oh. of age. Well, <laughs> there you know, went. There sentient went. weapons are always insane. But that that's the thing. I, I think it's actually a very good way to explain sentient weapons. Because oh, yeah, yeah. this is done out of love and out of responsibility. But in, in fact, you're creating something much more tortured. And you're actually not helping. Well, you're helping yourself, but you're not helping him. That has, again, as you do, uh, has given me more ideas than I came with. I realize it's a dark one, but at least this mm-hmm. time it fits with the source material. So yeah. what I want to do is try and bring it up for a moment from that, from the darkness, with something that could work to tell the story. There's a game that was recently kickstarted by my good friend Jake Richmond here in Portland, Oregon, and it's called The Magical Land of Yeld. Now, it kind of has a feel like a Narnia-style game. The premise is kids have been sucked through a portal to another world, and they have these supernatural challenges to overcome. Kids in a portal to another world, supernatural challenges to overcome, weapons to level up by powering up with souls. This could totally work for that. You just get rid of the built-in setting from Yeld and replace it with this land. Right. And it And Yeld has this mechanic in it where... Player characters who stay in Yeld too long 
slowly become monsters themselves. I like that. Which could fit very well with that if they don't come out. And like I mentioned, the movie Little Monsters, that's kind of a theme of Little Monsters. Like you can go to the monster land underneath the bed, but if you stay there too long, you become one of them. Yeah. Could work. World of Darkness. We could do World of Darkness. Mm-hmm. World of Darkness is pretty easy, mm-hmm. cut and dry kind of horror game. The uh, one I mentioned before, Hunter the Vigil, mm-hmm. uh, is kind of like very basic World of Darkness. But you know what? You don't even need to go into that. It has some club building mechanics. So you could kind of take out the club building mechanics from Hunter the Vigil. So you can kind of accessorize the Losers Club as they get a little bit better at fighting all of these things. With really just the base World of Darkness core book, you could pull it off. Yeah. Just lower the stats a little bit to represent kids. And in fact, I think kid or young or youth is a trait that you can take, which affects your stats somehow, but gives you some boons in other areas. My runner-up is a recently kickstarted game from Free Elegan. It is called Tales from the Loop. Tales from the Loop is the role-playing game of the 1980s that never was. It is set either in Sweden or somewhere in this uh, in uh, Arizona, Boulder City, in Boulder City. The premise of Tales from the Loop is the city, the town that the kids live in, has an underground particle accelerator, and weird shit happens as a result. There's weird technology, but you can ignore the weird technology mm-hmm. and simply use the existence of a magical or or uh, even scientific thing that people don't understand. There's something here in this town drawing things, such as interdimensional entities that feed on the fears of children. The reason I bring up Tales from the Loop is that Tales from the Loop was billed by many people as the Stranger Things RPG, Mm -hmm. and it very much is. Uh The mechanics really dive into playing a kid. You have kid-like abilities. You have kid-like stats and skills. You have kid-like roles. You pick character classes based on kid archetypes. And there's certain cool rules in it on how to do things. Like in order to truly exceed at something, you actually have to push yourself harder than you're willing to go. And frequently in the movie, these kids aren't just like, I'm just going to run up and punch the goblin. They're like, mother fuck, (laughs) I'm going to probably break my arm doing something like this. You have to put something on the line to really succeed, which is why I think that mechanic could work. Actually, yeah. yeah. Tales from the Loop is a beautiful, beautiful game. I don't think its setting would work because its setting has kind of weird 1980s high tech. But it's really cool. I'll bring it sometime. I've okay. got like one of those special editions, so I didn't want to bring it. Okay. I didn't want old granddad to get his <laughs> dirty mitts on my book. <laughs> it would only heighten the value. Probably. But Dusty's already mentioned a game that I ultimately want to talk about. Which is Little Fears. Little Fears is the role playing game of childhood terror. Little Fears has two editions. This is the first edition. I've actually never read the second edition called the Nightmare Edition. Little Fears is a controversial game because it deals about it. <laughs> with certain subjects that then and now are still considered rather controversial to have as components in a game setting. So in Little Fears, you play kids who are dealing with some trauma. And the, tr- the kids are going to be anywhere between the ages of, I think, 6 and 12. And the younger you are, the fewer stat You get to choose your, your age when you make a character. The younger you are, the lower your stats and skills are, but you have a high ability called innocence. And you can use points of innocence to get, like, free boons and succeed at things and bonus points. Innocence can also power belief magic. So investing a soul in yeah. And a baseball bat requires some innocence. The older you are, the closer you are to 13, you have less innocence. But you are more developed. You have more stats and more skills. In Little Fears, the setting that's built into it, you know, it's a character's dealing with trauma, dealing with when you make a character, you, you write down a list of things that you don't like about yourself. You have to deal with some of those things in the game. And a lot of it could be my dad beats me or my I, or I'm the middle child and I don't get any attention or uh, any kind. We're poor and or uh, I'm a special needs kid kind of stuff. There is a meta world in it called Closet Land. 
Closetland is the source of all childhood nightmares. Uh-huh. Closetland is the manifestation of young fear. And Closetland is ruled by seven night kings. The kings of Closetland, each representing one of the seven deadly sins. One of those sins is lust. And that Night King is terrible and awful, and it's about as bad as you can hmm. possibly think it would be. And the inclusion of that as a fearful component in the original edition of the game gave it a lot of controversy when it came out. But I think Closet Land is exactly what you're talking about, right. Matthew. Like going into that land of evil and darkness and fighting something. Like one of the enemies that they show in here, one of the, the is an evil clown. Yeah. And I think Little Fears could do this. So, Dusty, you've played this. Mm -hmm. I've run this. Mm -hmm. The person that introduced us was a player in my game at, at the time, Navita, mm -hmm. who will probably invite she's, on. She's talked a lot about this game. Little Fears, to this day, is the best game I ever ran. Or I should say that campaign. That mini campaign was the best game I ever ran. Through that game, I met... Met Jake, actually. Jake Richmond, who made Yelled. I met Jake through that game. I posted on an internet, on a live journal forum, I want to run a game about scared kids. And I want to get dark, like offensively dark. Like, trigger warnings. So this is the game I want to run. Is there anybody that's actually interested in exploring this with me? And I got a, a number of good responses. And we all got together. We decided that we would set it in 1989. And then we all act they all actually made characters that were the same age that they were in 1989. So we had like a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, two eight-year-olds, a nine-year-old, and an 11-year-old. And it worked. It worked yeah. very well. Everybody played what they knew at that time in that era. It's odd. The art actually reminds me of White Wolf. Mm -hmm. A little it, bit. It looks like the Book of Nod. Do you remember that yeah. one? Yeah, it's Vaguely. not. Yeah, Book of Nod was a little more sketchy, uh, but I can I can see where you're going with this with that. Wasn't that one mainly for the LARP? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very much so. It wasn't like a rule set or anything. Okay. It was just no. Background. It was a, it was a mythos background. Ah, gotcha. Cain and Abel and Cain becoming uh, the It's okay. very dark to the fledgling goth yeah. community. Yes, yeah. yeah. it was. Reading. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Was. I came into that book before I even knew it was for a game. I found it a hot topic. <laughs> and I didn't know that it was for a game. They had that at Hot yep. Topic? Yep. Hot Topic wow. used to be something else. Hot Topic used to be a very large something so else. So we ran this game, and in it... Yeah, tell us more about this. The, the theme was it was kids in this tiny little town on the Oregon coast called Agate Cove. Mm -hmm. And the premise, the, the story goes that before the game began, all the kids knew that two of their classmates had gone missing. They were uh, twins. And they had gone missing. And the game, we, we started play. I brought in stuffed animals and toy weapons and uh, action men from the time and set around. And the game opened up with everybody hanging out at their little clubhouse, which I was like, so tell me about your clubhouse. And they're like, oh, we have a clubhouse? I'm like, yeah, so tell me about it. They're like, oh, it's this uh, wrecked riverboat. And it's just like part of it that's kind of protruding from the marsh. That's where we hang out. Okay, and they called themselves the Cool Kids Club. You know, the opposite of the Losers Club, but they were the Losers <laughs> Club. They were the losers. But uh, each of them hung out together for different reasons. None of them had any other friends. And two of them were siblings. They, I started it out by just having them play with each other. Like, you're all sitting around. What game do you play? What, what game are you playing right now as kids? Mm -hmm. Are you playing tag? They're like, no, we're playing this game where we dare each other to go to this shack over there. And see who can, who can go up and touch the shack or something. <laughs> Your hand yeah. is raised. What? Okay, I want to read something. <laughs> this is in the game book, page 13. According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, over 2,000 children are reported missing every day. In the year 2000 alone, there were 685,000 cases involving missing children entered into the FBI's databases. The two major categories under which they were filed are involuntary, defined as missing under circumstances indicating that... The that the disappearance was not voluntary, i.e. abduction or kidnapping, and endangered, defined as missing and in the company of another person under circumstances indicating his or her physical safety is in danger. It is estimated that every year, 
28,000 children are in, taken involuntarily from the safety of the ones they love. Over 108,000 children are listing as endangered. And that's in the book. That's in the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These numbers fluctuate from year to year. Mostly they increase with short periods of stagnation. Sometimes they even drop, but inevitably they rise again. Authorities theorize as to the cause. Parents cry out in anger, wondering how the world got this bad. They want to know, how can we prevent this? Where did this evil come from? The answer was right under their noses, but they couldn't see it. If you want to know who it is, what it is, that is committing these crimes, that is influencing humankind to act in such cruel ways, you just need to do one simple thing. Ask the children. This book is fucking creepy, man. <laughs> Like and I it's said, like real world creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Role playing game of childhood terror. Jesus fucking H Christ. Mm -hmm. Remains of local boy found in McGovern yeah. country. <laughs> Suspect still at large. That's a page. Yeah. So we ran this game for seven or eight sessions. And Jesus in it, Christ, we no. got deeper and deeper into what was making. Do you need a drink? What was making the. <laughs> what was the deal with the missing kids? The kids came back, by the way, and they're like, mm -hmm. wait, something strange, the even stranger. What the fuck? You have forgotten, haven't you? Such a place full of pain and torture. A haven for monsters does not fit into your sane, rational world, now does it? But the children haven't forgotten. They know it waits for them, that it hungers for them. And they have given a name to this darkest of fears, the source of all their pain. They call it Closet Land. It is a child's hell. Page 18. I don't oh, want to so play this game. If anyone <laughs> votes for this game, I'm going to come to your house and punch you in the fucking nose. <laughs> I don't think people are going to vote for this game. God, I hope so. That. We ran this story for seven or eight sessions, and it concluded with them overcoming a villain that was um, one of the uh, missing kids, the, the missing mm -hmm. kids, their uncle, who we connected it to. We brought in some magical uh, background characters. Mm -hmm. like, they were afraid of this crazy bum they called the Beachcomber. They were all afraid of the beachcomber. And whenever the beachcomber would appear, it was kind of like the old man in Home Alone. Mm -hmm. He was like that weird mystical guy that they all had stories about him. And they kept being afraid of him. Turned out that he was actually one of the good guys. He was the, basically the turtle. And uh, the, the kids, the missing kids, the twins, their uncle was basically possessed by dark powers. Okay. There was a story that tied into news articles that they found connecting three people from back in the day who were, we decided were a witch's coven. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they defeated him eventually and found out that the two kids who were kidnapped and then had come back had never actually come back and they all imagined it. Adults never believed them. And adults not ever believing you is a main theme of this game. And Tales from the Loop. You can't rely upon the adults to do anything because once you get to age 13, you've lost all your innocence and all of that ability to see cl the closet land, but at the same time, the ability for closet land to feed upon you mm -hmm. is gone. Hmm. Teenagers go off into their own things and have their own new interests as their, their interest in the greater becoming world. Becoming young adults. Yeah, yeah, the coming of age. This is the pre-coming of age game. I really don't want to play this. I'm still flipping through this and... I know you can't see my face, but... Well, that said, I do think it's perfect for this. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, oh, yeah. You're, you're entirely correct. For and the movie, this is a very... This yeah. is a perfect game. It really is. But yeah. uh, to play it, you got to have a... You know, going back and reading it after I played that, that one uh -huh. session, like getting a, ha a copy of the book and going through and reading it, you you got to have some mental fortitude to even like get into that mindset to even if you were playing it as an just playing an adult in that game you you have to be pretty solid with yourself to play and the yeah, people are, playing and the people game. around you you have to trust <laughs> the people that are around you to play this game because it it gets into some deep psychological areas did you yeah. say that it yes, gets I into did. some yeah. deep psychological areas yeah, it did because it does it being the game it does and so does the game jesus christ no no, However, no, no. check this out. I know a way to play a sequel to this game. Okay. So we ran Little Fears for about seven or eight sessions, and then we decided to come back to those characters as teenagers. Mm -hmm. What were their teenage lives like? The characters that made it through the ordeal. There's another game out there called Monster Hearts, 
Monster Hearts is the role-playing game of paranormal teenage angst and romance. It is essentially Teen Wolf, Twilight, The Glades, <laughs> oh, any of those things. God. I know you joke, but it's actually it's an award-winning game, and it's really good. It's very queer it, it's, it's just putting It's in, putting those... Uh, TV shows or movies in front of it. Yeah. It just makes me just. It just makes me not even interested. Have you watched Teen Wolf? Because it's amazing. I've watched a couple episodes just okay. to see what it's, it's about. It's really good. It, yeah. I think it's one of the best shows on television. But we came back to it and played Monster Hearts, playing some of the same characters and continuing forward. Things from the past coming back to the present to, mm-hmm. to haunt them as in their teens. Monster Hearts. You each take an archetype like the vampire, the mo- the werewolf, the ghost, the mummy whatever, but then you can either play them straight paranormal or you can use them as metaphors for your place in life. Mm -hmm. Like the witch is somebody who casts magical hexes on people or you can play the witch as just that toxic bitch who is manipulating everybody and always has beef on people and that's how she wields her magic. Or the vampire doesn't have to be an actual bloodsucker. They can be that one guy who's always at the party playing the guitar that all the girls are always over, and he's basically <laughs> sucking the life out of them. The uh, werewolf I've known is a few just of those a, guys. Be, werewolf could just be a fucking bruiser, somebody with rage issues. So we played it, and it worked very well. I don't care. I don't want to play this game. Not and under any fucking you know, circumstances. By, by, by doing that, you just made it like that's what everybody is going to and vote for. And then we have a sequel plan for that. Taking that story again, 20 years later, using another game called Unknown Armies, which is the role-playing game of modern, of postmodern horror. Mm-hmm. We'll dive into that in a later subject, but Unknown Armies is what I consider one of the five best games ever made. And Unknown Armies could do a continuation of that story. I think if we did It Part 2, Unknown Armies is probably what I would pitch for that. I was just thinking something, too. You know what else would work for this? What? I mean, the setting is all wrong, but the system is all right. What? The Elric of Malini Bone role-playing game. I've never read the system. What's it like? Um, I mean, it's it's a fairly standard uh, second-tier 90 system. Lots of dice, big character sheet. But the, the setting's wrong. All, all the stuff about souls and elder gods and creatures coming from beyond to feast is, I mean... This is a limbo world that exists between the present world of men and the world of the unknown monster, is the world of Malinibone. And, yeah, the the setting's wrong, but the mechanic could work, too. So Little Fears has a very basic character sheet. I saw that, and I really liked it. It it yeah. looks like a piece of homework. It looks like a piece of homework. For a kid. <laughs> There's a little picture that says, this is me. And you have your muscle stat, your feet, your smarts, your hands, and your spirits. You have stats such as soul, innocence, and fear, which builds up over time. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one thing that I noticed about innocence that I thought was interesting, and that it's you can't. It gets used up over time, it, and, yeah, and you do not does get not it back. Come back. But when it's gone, and you had mentioned this, I yeah. think while I was busy being horrified by the book, and I just kind of <laughs> when it's it gone, you're no longer a character. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a good mechanic. Yeah, yeah it really is. Yeah, yeah. You're it's no longer. Like, it's like uh, Susan from uh, Narnia, who just can't yeah. see it anymore. It's just gone. You can't see the closet realm, closet land. So the things that you write down about your character, and these are all blanks in columns. Well, first off, you have your, your health levels. Your health levels are called I feel, colon, fine, sore, bad, dizzy, and then finally, nothing. Hmm. About myself, you have a list of things I like, things I don't like. This is my stuff, but I like these best. I hang out with, but blank is my best friend. My favorite person is, I know no matter what I can always talk to. When I grow up, I want to be a blank because blank. I have a blank and it's special because blank. My biggest fear is when I get scared, I do blank. When I know monsters are around, I blank. And then finally, a paragraph. What's your home, what's your home life like? Yeah. <laughs> I had an amazing personal discovery running this game. It was kind of 
not quite, but I guess you could equate it to a religious experience. Multiple players cried. We mm-hmm. got into it. Navita can basically cry on command. She's yeah, one she of the can. best role players I've ever played with. Everybody got into it. Some of the best quotes I've ever heard. If, if, if you can't choke an eight-year-old in your backyard, this isn't America. <laughs> like, they, oh like, just <laughs> some of the... We- wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so when you're writing the description, make sure you put that in. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's going to be the tagline Christ. at the bottom. <sighs> I don't we like are... this episode. I don't like this game. <laughs> I want to move on to something fun. Should have done Event Horizon. <laughs> Should have done Event Horizon. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> well, that was it. You got it. Stop that. You have got to stop that. I'm trying to bring some levity to the situation. <laughs> That's not how you do it. That's just scorn. <laughs> Seriously, we this is a dark episode, guys. Yeah, it, it kind of it was, and I think our listeners can feel it. And I'm sorry. I think I think we can feel it just sitting yeah. here. We're we're just not as quippy tonight. We're not as animated. no. I, I feel I feel ill. I don't think that I thought enough about the movie, and then when I thought about the movie, and then I thought about the game, and then I read this goddamn game, I don't, I just, I don't like it. What's weird is that I came prepared to talk positively about the movie mm-hmm. and positively about this game, but the longer we started talking, I'm dreading my the whole concept spirit because just dropped. Yeah. Well, yeah, because the 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 set the movies we have set up coming up, upcoming. Yeah. Uh, there's only one somewhat humorous in that group. Yeah. So, and the rest are all heavy. If you haven't picked this up yet, this is our horror movie month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where we're doing in a month of this stuff where we're just <laughs> going to be horrified with the whole thing. <laughs> ah! Okay. I'm putting my foot down. I don't want to talk about this one anymore. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I officially think we're all good. Out. I think we're all good. The, yeah. We, this is, I think we all agree. So again, yeah. so this rarely happens. So this is this is two, this is two on me then because I had I, I give you guys a bad taste for Valerian. What was you? And then the bad taste for it. Why so, you got to make us feel shit, man? <laughs> so far, both of your <laughs> desires to see new movies in every set have been down. What's, what's this? Both. Let me that wasn't movies. my thing. No, no, that was me. Oh, I'm okay. the one, I'm oh, the one okay. that wants to have uh, a new movie. I can movie see how that could be series. misunderstood. Yeah. No, both of his desires to bring in new movies are brought. St- I want to do Big Trouble in Little China. I don't want to do I'm, this shit. I'm, I'm <laughs> totally fine with doing that. That was actually set up for like the yeah. last series, but uh, it never happened. This is terrifying. I, I, you know, and honestly, as I sit here, and it, it's because I'm sitting here and I'm talking and I'm thinking about it now, which has made the movie scarier mm-hmm. because I was thinking about all the stuff. That the writers mm-hmm. and the plot design people were thinking about the whole time. And while I wasn't scared in the theater, now I'm getting a little freaked out <laughs> because I'm thinking. <laughs> and immediately after we close this, I am going to stop thinking chemically. Thank you, old granddad. I'm surprised you haven't opened that bottle stop. yet. You're going to stop thinking and start drinking. Yeah. And on that I've, note, I've had quite enough of this shit. I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And let us never speak of this again. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're a new name in the enormous sea of podcasts and appreciate any feedback that you can send our way. If you like what you've heard, or even if you didn't, please leave us a review and let us know. Got a movie or a game that you want to hear us talk about? Drop us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com or hit us up on any of the usual social networks. We'd love to hear from you. The opening theme music is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, part of the public domain and found on publicdomain4u.com. Opening narration is provided by Isaac Scher. Half Movies Will Game is distributed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again next week.